Now, let's head to Knoxville and say hello to Mr. Tony Basilio, sports talk show host extraordinaire in the Knoxville, Tennessee area. Tony, how are you? George, it is a blessed day here and probably our last nice day that we're going to get here in quite a while because, um, you know, we've had spring-like weather here, but the winter stuff's rolling back in. Hopefully not for long, Tony. We're 22 days from opening day. I'm not willing to buy it long term. That is music to my ears, my friend. 22 yeah. days opening day. Wow. Bring it on. So mm -hmm. let me start with Hendon Hooker, who went to the Combine in Indy last week. First of all, what are you hearing? I'm guessing he made a really good impression in interviews. Did he do interviews? I believe he did. Obviously, there are teams that, you know, see him as draftable, as Watson has uh, opined on here. And Watson thinks he's going to surprise some people in terms of where he's going to go. Um, the thing I thought was really interesting about him, and this is this is the season, right, where people poke holes at people's games. And there's, as you know, there's a game that's played in the NFL game where uh, – certain organizations will leak things to guys in the press about this player, or that player, when the whole time they have their eyes on, but they're just, <laughs> they either want to bring down the value of a, of a certain prospect in the eyes of other teams or try to shape a narrative or whatever it is. You can't tell me that the way uh, the NFL game currently sets with the challenge they have with finding quality quarterbacks uh, that a Hendon Hooker won't get an opportunity in that league. Now, what will his draft position be? Your guess is good as mine. I, I'd say that's speculation at this point, especially coming off the injury. But George, at the same time, I, I thought his answers last week publicly were really interesting when he said, look, you know, I was in a one read offense, but my guys were always open. So, so what did you want me to do? I mean, go to the second read, go to the third read. I mean, my, my guys were open. And, and I think that's, I think, um, you know, the, his play, which in a year and a half was otherworldly uh, here, the fact that it looks so easy, I think really um, is a great compliment to him. I, I know that the narrative at the NFL level as well, you know, he played in one read offense and he's the product of it. And uh, I'm not so fast on that. He was playing that position at a really high level. And the people at Tennessee that I talked to believe he has the aptitude to play at the next level. And, you know, to some extent, aptitude is almost as important as physical skills when you get to and you see how some of these guys flame out at the NFL level. You You could have made a real case for him had he stayed healthy to be the Heisman Trophy winner. Watson, let me bring you in here because you have been very outspoken that not only do you think he's going to be drafted, but you think he's, he's going to surprise people with how high he's going to be drafted. So spit it out. Where, How high do you think he's going to be drafted? I don't think he's out of the second round. I think he'll fall wow. in the second round somewhere. I've even seen um, grades now since the combine's over, which he couldn't throw in. I have seen grades where they have him in front of people have him. Some people have him in front of Levis that he's in the top four and Levis was mm. five. And uh, uh, I knew going, I brought this up to Tony, I guess last week or a couple of weeks ago, I knew when he got there, the questions were going to be, are you this good? Or are you a victim of the offense? I knew that was coming. And man, did he nail it. He, he said, look at the throws that I made. They're all big boy throws. He said, if we don't throw the ball behind the line of scrimmage, our downfield throws are big boy throws, meaning the, these take arm strength, small windows, and I know what he's talking about. Some of those fades up the boundary that he'd complete time after time after time with a small, small areas to throw it into. And those seams he would hit in the, in the middle of the field around the hashes. Those are big boy throws. 
And I would venture to say every of all of the guys on there, he probably had some of the tougher throws. Yeah, his people were open, but they're not easy throws to get them to him. So if I was grading him, Tony, and he had stayed healthy, I think he would have graded out number one. He has size. He has height. He has arm strength. He has quick release, and he and he performed. The number one quarterback down there in the in the in the combine was Richardson, because he's six four, two forty, ran four uh, four three something. I think it was or four four three maybe something. He ran very very well. He had the strongest arm. They said it was there uh, in in the camp. But he didn't perform. Hendon did both. I think he would have been the number one rated quarterback, guys, if he hadn't gotten hurt. And that's why I think he will stay in the top two. And somebody, he will, he won't just be a good player. He is going to be a really good pro, in my opinion, and, and, a, and a starter for a long time. And see, I think that's that's a really interesting point you bring up in terms of. I don't know if I'm ready to go with you there on him being a starter in that league. I certainly think there's a place for him in that league. Um, I don't know. You and I are going different. I, I don't know, George. I don't know where you are on that. I, I look at him and I say, certainly an organization is going to value him. Uh, Watson, I hope you're right. I, I hope somebody takes him highly. If, if somebody takes him there, they're going to value him to be – and have a crack at starting down the line. I, I hope I hope we'll you see. are singing off the correct songbook here. It's going to be interesting to see because, you know, he does do a lot of those things, but his measurables, whereas the Richardson kid is just, you know, he, he is off the charts in terms of the physical stuff, but it's the rest of it you wonder about with a guy like that. And he didn't function in some of the bigger games the way Hooker did. Now, no. did he have the supporting cast around him? Did he have the system? I mean, all those things are, um, you know, are, are, are certainly up for debate. My thing about Hooker is, ask Nick Saban what he thinks of Hendon Hooker. His defense hadn't been skewered like that his lifetime. <laughs> and that kid was lights out that day. And that's the biggest stage. Hey, in our league, that's the biggest possible stage you can get on one of those uh, CBS games where you're playing Alabama, it doesn't get better than that. Well, guys, when was he not lights out? The one game that he got That's hurt right. in, he, he he was not lights out. The rest of them, That's right. he, he was top of the line. Everybody wants to talk about Bryce Young. Well, yeah, he's small, but he makes all the plays. Hendon Hooker beat him that day, making all the plays. And I, I'm, I, I'll be shocked if this young man isn't a really good pro. He is tall enough, guys. He is tall enough. He's he's not yeah. six foot. He's not six two. He's closer between six three and six four. And he's tall enough. There's no doubt in my mind, and there's no doubt he has arm strength. Now, the thing that he didn't have to do in these last two years is a, a, a complicated look here. They're doubling on this side. I got to go to the other side and throw here. Because of what they did, he didn't have to do that. And the little bit I saw him have to do it, I didn't think he was great at it in third and long. That's when it would happen to him. But nobody is real good in third and long. Uh, nobody. And um, except some of these Patrick Mahomes, once they've been in the league a while and seen all the stuff. But I think he's going to be a really good player. I've thought that since uh, going into this year, I thought it, and he didn't let me down that way. I thought he was the best quarterback in college football this year. If he hadn't got hurt, whether he won the Heisman or not, I thought he performed better. In the games he played in, I think he outperformed every one of them. And the two he had to outperform was Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud. The other two, Levis and Richardson, did not. And I don't think, Tony, it's system because they're, they're missing open guys. It's not like all their guys were covered and Richardson had to just take off and run. There wasn't anything there. He's missing open guys. The one game I thought he played up to NFL standards was Tennessee. 
I thought he played up to standards again in Knoxville that day. Uh, but then he came back the next week and didn't. So you're taking a chance on everybody. Two of them are undersized a little bit, and two of them didn't perform up to the standards. Hendon Hooker would have been the one of the five that you could have said has both the pieces, in my opinion, if he hadn't gotten hurt. Tony isn't the real answer. Who drafts him and what is their need? You know, is it they draft him, but they've got a clearly established number one for the next, you know, two to three years? Or right. is it a team that drafts him that deep down isn't in love with their number one and has done it to see if a year later when he's really healthy, he could be the number one? I think that's really an interesting question because, you know, the other side of the NFL coin is, and we're going to see this in Philadelphia, if you can find a guy and you bring him in, like the Eagles had Jalen Hurts and basically sat him there for a year with Carson Wentz, let him play some, but at the end of the day, they were still committed to Wentz and they they brought him in. Um, if you can get a guy to shine in his rookie deal, though, that final year of his rookie deal, you can really load up against that cap and go out and try to put a super team together, which is sort of what the Eagles did this year with like free agency and all that. And you, you get a brief window there. Um, you know, I, that's that's why I, I keep going back and forth on Hooker. George, I, I think he's a really nice player. I don't like him the way Watson does at the pro level. Um, but... Hey, I hope Watson's right. I, I think that'd be an incredible story for a kid to come from Virginia Tech to basically be kind of a wreck there is sort of what he was at the end of his time there. He had that game where it was cold and he was over there shivering on the sidelines and the things that the uh, Tech fans were saying about him. And then he basically ascends to the top of college football to the point where somebody – like Watson, and then there are other people that are saying, hey, this guy's really impressive. I mean, character-wise, I just know at Tennessee that uh, they were really impressed. Basically, the book I got on him was, this is a 35-year-old guy in a 21, 22-year-old kid's body, which, hey, you know, that's a, that's a, so you don't have to worry about him. You don't have to worry about uh, he can, he comports himself like a quarterback, I guess is my point. Um, and you know, money's not going to change him. So you're right, George, he's got to get to me. He's got to get in the right spot yep. for somebody to let him grow. Cause if he doesn't, uh, I think it'd be, it's going to be hard for him, but I think that's a good read on it. You sound like you're right in the middle of where me and Watson are. Yeah. I think I've, I've gone on somebody's roster. He's not a star player though. Like Watson think he, thinks he is. I'm somewhere in between y'all. So let yeah. me let me shift gears for a minute to hoops. Sure. What's the reaction in Knoxville that Tennessee couldn't close out Auburn? I mean, my post game show. I was. Uh, I got telling myself here. I, I was not good. I was just in foul mood. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Guys, in 18 in 18 regular season games, Tennessee scored. It's on my blog today. They scored, I want to say, 74 fast break points. They are 299 in America. Fast break points. And and look, I know I, you know, Rick Barnes old school and this and that defense for you gotta run a little bit. In two games against Auburn, Tennessee scored a whopping zero fast break points zero now when you look at the Vols George are they good enough offensively to just say we're not going to even try to run and get an easy basket here or there well you're, you're making a really yeah. good point that at some point you got to get some cheapies everybody does right? yes I mean I looked per just for the heck of it I look up Barnes uh last year with Kennedy Chandler and I thought was well, surely this is just this team, and they're not built to run. Last year's team was 274 in America uh, in terms of um, – I mean, there's like 300 and whatever there are teams. Yeah. They were 274 last year 
with Kennedy Chandler. They're two ninety nine this year. I would have thought. So so basically, Barnes is so old school that we're just not going to run. And I go back to when we had a conversation about this yesterday, and it made people angry. And it was not my intention to make people angry. Basically, it was my intention to get this off my chest that I can't watch this much longer. It's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> uh, the, the game with Vanderbilt, you were there. Yeah. The Phillips kid steals a ball. He's got a pretty open lane. All he's got to do is get in and lay the ball up. Tennessee probably wins the game. Now, you don't know what's going to happen, but they probably win the game. Yeah. What's he do? He does not do what you do 100 times out of 100. In the moment, we all criticized the kid. Now that I've had a chance to think about it and realize that these guys didn't even score 100 fast break points in an 18-game season, which that's five or six points a game if you do do the math roughly. In fact, not they didn't come close to it. They were on the north side of 75. Point is this. I think that is a kid that had that instinct almost coached out of him by that head coach who's so defensive oriented. And I know people don't want to hear that. And I know people don't, but you got to let your players play, man. You, and, 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 and I'm saying this about a guy that won 22 regular season games in Barnes, but now comes the time of the year where you really got to let your players play. And it's just not his deal. And I think that's why he hadn't been good in March throughout his career. I think his teams are overcoached. And I hate to say that. I'm not trying to come down on the guy. The guy's a Hall of Fame coach. But I, I, I just look at those numbers and I say, how in, in, in basketball can you not score some easy points every once in a while, especially when you're that deficient in your half-court offense? Watson, take it from there. Tony, I, I worry about – I think that's part of the reason they have these very poor shooting nights because yep. they never get – in football, you want to start games with your quarterback and 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 ha- give him easy throws, get his confidence, mm-hmm. get his percentage up, get his confidence going, and then you get going. You might stick a deep ball in there every once in a while. That's why you always try to start, especially when you have inexperienced guys. Tennessee don't ever get the easy shots because they don't fast break. And so they don't gain the confidence and they're out there shooting threes or they're, or they're having contested layups. And, and I think that's the reason they have these games where they just absolutely just have 28% shoot nights. It's because they never get confidence. And when you play that slow down style, Nobody yeah. ever gets in any rhythm. That's what scares me. They don't get in rhythm. And you know I'm a Coach Barnes fan, so I am. You love, yeah. I, I'm prejudiced yeah. through my brother, uh, but I am a yep. Coach Barnes fan. But, Tony, they – they they in, of everybody in the league, they have these nights where they shoot 28%, and I think that's the reason. I totally agree with that. And, look. I'll say this for Rick Barnes. You are never, and I mean ever, never, ever, as a never, ever going to have a situation like what you had at Alabama with him as your head coach. Because that ain't, that would not, that would, first of all, they, all the kids that were involved in that would have been gone off his team the next day. I don't care what it would have cost him. I'm just telling you that's the way it is with him. And that is, then that's the way it'll be. But the thing about him is, is that it's just defense is everything with that guy. And at some point, you've got to be able to put the ball in the hole. You know, Tennessee this year is number one in uh, field goal percentage efficiency in terms of people. People can't make shots against them. That's even more opportunities to run, guys. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not trying to get ugly about it here. Got to let you guys breathe a little bit. You know, there were a lot of things that happened in Saturday's game against Auburn that would lead me to believe they could have a tourney run. Their freshmen, I mean, their their seniors played really well. Their freshman, Phillips, looked very active, very athletic, very active. Um, their defense wasn't as good, but on the offensive end, they were 
you know, they were crisper. They seemed to be having a little bit of fun and this, this, that, and the other thing. I just look at their team and I say, can you win two games and get to the Sweet 16? The number on Barnes in his career is if he's a four seed or higher, he's never lost the opening round game. Tennessee figures to right now be a three seed. Now they could go out and lose to Missouri and probably fall to the four line. I don't think they're going to fall past far past that, but it's that second round game. And for this fan base, it becomes a one game season because there are a lot of people who have seen all of Rick Barnes magic tricks, kind of like what the way they became at Texas and were tired of not getting out of the first weekend when they had exemplary basketball teams. And we can debate whether or not that's fair. Uh, football, obviously, Watson is a completely different game than basketball. Basketball, football is all about that regular season. Basketball, unfortunately for Rick Barnes, in the eyes of a lot of people, is all about that tournament. And it it's going to be very interesting because essentially, I think, you're going to have a one game season for to see if Rick Barnes can get his guys to the sweet 16. And if he can, you know, I'll say, Hey, that's a great job. That's a great season. If he doesn't, what's going to be said about him is in eight basketball seasons, you accomplish exactly as much as Conzo Martin did in Knoxville. And he did it in half the time, which is one sweet, one sweet 16 appearance. And guys, we can debate whether or not that's fair. But there's a scoreboard up there for a reason, and that's kind of going to be the way the cookie crumbles. And and to be honest with you, I don't know, draw, no draw, I don't know if Tennessee's consistent enough to go and win two NCAA tournament games. So far this season, they've kind of proven themselves untrustworthy in that in that manner. Uh, I So I would not trust them to win two NCAA tournament games right now. That said, anything can happen. Watson, well, keep going. The, Tony, what about – how did – I didn't get to see the Auburn game, so I'm asking questions here. How did it look without Ziegler? Uh, did Vescovi take over as the point guard? Did they get through that okay? Did you – did that look okay to you? They were really good um, until it really mattered. Late in the game – which I think is when point guard play, you know, the first 35 minutes of a game, okay, fine. The ball's had a three-point lead with 6.15 to play and didn't score a field goal in the final 6.15, which Watson's what you're talking about, the way that offense kind of comes and goes. And when it goes, it yeah. really goes. Yeah. But yeah. they were – they got in pretty good positions. Uh, you know, this 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 Vescovy guy is just a – he's one cool customer, plays hard all the time. The key kid from down in Salina, Tennessee, played really, really well. Uh, when they gave him a chance to play some point, they let Triple J uh, handle the ball a little bit. and You know, he's a nice veteran presence. Look, these guys have an, a veteran senior-laden team mixed with some pretty good young players. If they could just get their feet about them in that tournament, they looked Saturday like a team that could go on a run. I wish I trusted them, but, but in order to go on a run in my mind, in that tournament, you got to score some easy points every once in a while. And they have a coach for whatever reason, who's averse to it. And I'm criticizing. And I know people say you don't, he knows more about you. He knows a million times more about than I do, but I know one thing in that game, when you are as offensively challenged as the Vols are, and you decide as a matter of principle, that you're not going to take cheap points, as George was calling them earlier, you're making it so much harder on yourself to defeat people. That's my opinion. Hey, Tony, um, first of all, as all, oh, let me do this. So the Vols play Thursday afternoon. You will be, I'm trying to do the math in my head, you'll be on the air probably oh. around 5.30 Central time. No, 530. Is that right? 
Eastern they'll, time. They'll tip off around 2.30 yeah. Central, probably. Okay, so you do a post game that gets pretty lively. Tell people how they can hear it, and I'm sorry for <laughs> screwing up my math. <laughs> Oh, George, we're all in broadcasting for a reason. Yes, we are. That's doing, I don't think anybody doing a talk show is going to split an atom anytime soon with their <laughs> intellect. Uh, that that said, I uh, I am on T Club dot team T Club dot team. George, it is everything I can do. Like my wife looks at me half the time and goes, "I don't know how you made it through the day. I'm glad you made it through the day, but you know," she said, "You're you're doing a great thing talking into a microphone." Probably the one thing, one the one skill in life I'm I actually am qualified. Uh, the one job in life I'm qualified to have. But yeah, I do that sometimes, George. I screw up the time zones, <laughs> yes. and then I'm going three thirty, four thirty. The game's over at this time. It starts. At, y'all live in Nashville. I mean, that's just got to be because all the times that are given on these. Oh yeah, are always Eastern. Eastern time. So oh, you got to yeah. always re re computing. I would never last. If that was going on, I'd be an hour later, an hour early for everything. But uh, thanks, guys. 